You're listening to the Monday Night Community Show with Daniel on BRFM. This is the Daniel Monday Night Community Show on demand through YouTube. Thank you very much for choosing to listen to us through this method. If you'd like to keep up to date with when I add new interviews, then subscribe to this channel. We're talking live in the studio to Ian Goodwin from the Chevy Coast Garden. I know you next wanted to do uh, some uh, safety. Yeah. yeah, I do. I mean, I want to just use the strap line, life jackets save lives. And uh, I, I, I truly believe this. Well, it's not truly believe. Statistics show that uh, if you're going afloat for pleasure, working around water or fishing, wear your life jacket or buoyancy aid. It's useless otherwise. Now, I've seen quite a number of people set off to sea without any buoyancy aid or life jacket on and there have been a number of occasions in the years that I've been a Coast Guard rescue officer where people have drowned because of the simple fact they've not worn a life jacket or buoyancy aid. It's just as simple as that. There's a direct correlation of falling in the water and drowning without and you're not wearing a particular life jacket. Now accidents can happen at any time in any weather and good training and common sense help. But lives could be saved every year if people wore correctly fitted, well-maintained life jackets or buoyancy aids. Now the water around the UK is cold all year round and it's particularly cold at this time of the year and it's surprisingly difficult uh, to get back on board your boat once you're in the water and the cold water will affect how your body works. Wearing a life jacket with the crotch straps and spay hoods correctly fitted can increase your can can significantly increase your chances of survival and increase your likelihood of being found and we've had a, a couple of incidences last year where people have worn a life jacket and it has saved their lives and and in in local waters and uh, and and you know they fit they've not only put the life jacket on they fitted the crotch straps underneath so it doesn't come up over the head when they fall in the water because what happens when you fall into cold water your blood pressure increases and you begin gasping for air and if you're not wearing a life jacket that lifts that lifts your airways out of the water you will breathe in enough water to drown Without that life jacket, you are going to perish because you're going to start to breathe very heavily and you're going to take on water into your lungs and that will lead to you drowning. And if you do fall into cold water, don't attempt to swim unless you're really close to your boat. Relax as much as you can. Very difficult, I know, but um, you will be shivering and very cold. And find something to hold on to if you can while your body adapts and you regain control of your breathing. After this, you should be able to call for help or get back on board quickly. And your rescuers should find it easy, easier to help you if you're wearing a life jacket because you can pull them up by them. Now, the activities that need life jackets the most, uh, statistics tell us that commercial fishing, angling and sailing are the activities where most lives might be saved by wearing a life jacket. And every year, a panel of experts meet to analyse the year's fatality, uh, so the, the year's fatal maritime incidents. Now, the panel makes a judgment about whether it, it is probable, possible, or unlikely that a person involved who, who was, you know, a fatality could have been saved had they been wearing a life jacket or buoyancy aid. And between 2007 and 2010, the panel agreed that 86 lives might have been saved if those involved had been wearing a life jacket or buoyancy aid. Now, that's, that's one every two weeks, in, in, in essence. And make sure that you wear it. So all I can say is make sure you wear a life jacket or buoyancy aid. And the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency recommends that commercial fishermen wear a life jacket or buoyancy aid at all times whilst on the deck. Now, one assumes that our commercial fishermen who come out of Queenborough will uh, will always wear their life jackets. I can't comment because I've never seen them going to sea, but one makes the assumption uh, that they all wear their particular life jackets, particularly when they're on deck, as to do not to do so 
uh, would be uh, a, 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 an error of judgment on their part. I think you next wanted to cover some of the incidents. Yeah, we've had a few incidents since the last time I've been on. I mean, I did mention some, one or two. We've had a, a couple of ordnance, de- uh, that's, that's bombs basically, on, on the beach, which were disposed of by the Royal Navy. Um, we've had a couple of uh, royal fish where we've um, had to dispose of, um, I think, a couple of uh, harbour porpoises. Um, we've uh, done a number of searches for, for missing people uh, and we've done a couple of uh, incidents in relationship uh, to, to, to mud uh, rescue. But I just wanted to highlight one, one which, is, which, we've, we, which we've undertaken, and that's for the search uh, for Ben. I, I've forgotten what his surname is. He, he, he was last seen on some pier in, in the Medway, uh, near where the old Staples, uh, where it's closing down Staples. And um, that was the last time he was seen, over, over 30, 30, 35 days ago. And uh, still hasn't, you know, no, we, I mean, one, one assumes he's fallen in the water. But with uh, our colleagues at Medway and with the police, we've, we've done some extensive searches now of, of the Medway areas in, in places where I didn't even know existed in the Medway. I thought I'd covered most of the areas, but uh, not on this. And um, I think the latest one we got called to was actually on Christmas Day. It was uh, it was Christmas Day. Uh, I think it was about uh, midday, one o'clock, and I got called out. And it, uh, it was it turned out to be uh, some uh, um, young lads who uh, were obviously having a good time, and uh, then the noise had been misinterpreted for cries of help, which it wasn't. They were just having a good time on the beach. Uh, with uh, some spirits, <laughs> and I need I need I say more. Uh, completely uh, not doing anything wrong, but uh, obviously having a good old laugh and crying around, shouting and screaming, as one does when you've been drinking spirits. And uh, that led to a member of the public to com- uh, conclude that perhaps uh, they were in difficulties, but they weren't, and they were in, they were in a very jocular mood. And it was Christmas Day. So really, those are the sort of incidents we've been to. We've had a couple of broken down vessels uh, where we go and meet and greet them, uh, primarily on the Queenborough All Tide Landing. And we had one medical evacuation where the individual was brought in to uh, the, the, uh, the Canva, which is where the Sheerness lifeboat is. In terms of our training this year, uh, we've done some work uh, some work with the with the lifeboat for recovering uh, bodies and 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 recovering uh, individuals who've collapsed and and recovering them in a safe uh, manner from the hull of a, a of a lifeboat and uh, we've also done uh, quite a bit of training in relationship to rebadging ourselves with mud competencies. Um, when, once we actually get competent, we are given a ticket to operate either as a technician or an operative and there are various levels and skills within there and uh, we've just all been recently badged for our mud rescue which gives us a three-year ticket um, next next month i'm off to there's a couple of us who need to be rebadged on our water entry and we'll be going down to little hampton and we will be going into the tidal flows pro- appropriately equipped and we will then be reassessed on our water entry. I'm looking forward to it. Um, it'll probably be rather cold in February, but e- either way, you know that's that's something we need we need to we need to practice in all weathers. So that should be an interesting thing to do. Dalph, are you going to talk a little bit about tidal surges? Yeah, yeah, we had uh, we had a tidal surge or, or what's called a storm surge uh, on uh, the early hours of Friday morning, about 1 a.m. And about two o'clock in the afternoon on on Saturday, and the storm surge or tidal surge is the same thing. It is possibly one of the most dramatic weather effects in the UK, resulting from low pressure, high winds, and tidal conditions. Now, a, a tidal surge is a change in sea level that is caused by a storm. This can lead to extensive flooding and are dangerous to, for people living in many coastal areas. For example, when Hurricane Katrina, Katrina approached the US coast in 2005, 
it generated a storm surge of more than eight metres in some areas. And what that basically means is, if you think of high water and you've seen along the beach, imagine it being about another 25 feet higher. That is a significant tidal surge. And this uh, led to widespread flood flooding, including most, uh, almost all of the, of the city of New Orleans, where the sea defences, or levees, uh, couldn't cope with the water level. In fact, Led Zeppelin actually wrote a, a song called When the Levee Breaks, which was on one of their albums, and it was all about the levee, which around the New Orleans uh, environment, and the levees did break, and uh, uh, more than 1,800 people were killed across the US by Hurricane Katrina, many of them by the storm surge flooding. Now, what causes a storm surge? Well, the main cause of a storm surge is high winds pushing the seawater towards the coast. And what we had was winds coming down from the north, pushing it towards the east coast, causing it or the water to pile up there. There is also a smaller contrib contribution from the low pressure at the centre of the storm, pulling the water up about one centimetre for every one millibar change in pressure. This is called the inverse barom barometer effect and is similar to what happens when you drink through a straw. Now, the strong winds in a storm generate large waves on top of the surge, which can cause damage to sea defences or spill over the top, adding to the flood risk. Uh, and basically, um, I mean, just recently and la in about 2013 on, in December, a large storm surge hit the east coast of the UK, causing widespread, widespread flooding along the coast. And this was a prime example of how low pressure, high winds and high tidal conditions combine to, to bring in a, a storm. And what we had was an area of low pressure across the top of the North Sea. It pushed water southwards, causing sea levels to rise more over the shallow seabed. And the strong northwesterly winds behind the low whipped up large waves on top of the rising sea levels, leading to coastal flooding at high tide. So we had a combination of high tides. And um, to put it into context, we normally get about six, 6 6.2 metres on a high water, on a very high water. We were touching eight metres um, around Sheppey. So it was significantly up. And if you go along the beach now, even today, you can actually see... Uh, the remnants, the flotsam and jetsam, which is being cast out from, from you know, the b rubbish, basically. Uh, flotsam and jetsam is um, organic, as well as man-made rubbish like bin liners and things like that. And that's all, you can see how high that's gone up. And that's basically what a surge tide is. It's all a combination of, of wind, high waters and low pressure. Well, Ian, as always, we'd like to thank you very much once again for uh, coming along. We look forward to seeing you in a couple of months' time. Absolutely. Thank you very much, and, uh, uh, and good evening to all your listeners.